very nice to have all of you here. Um, I really can't make eye contact. I, I normally, you know, when I when I talk, I love to make eye contact and and uh, you know have more of a conversation. But because of these circumstances, I guess we'll make we'll make the most of um, what what we uh, what we have. So again, thank you so much for joining, and I, I look forward to hopefully having a wonderful session with all of you. Um, I'm going to basically present. Uh, some slides and I'll, I'll talk over that. Um, hopefully if you have questions, you know, Rupesh is also looking at the discussions so he can, uh, you know, he can bring up questions. He'll be giving you some surveys as well. So uh, hopefully keep it a little bit interactive. Um, I'm gonna start by presenting here. Please give me a second. Uh, please let me know if you can see my window uh, with the title, or I guess I won't know, but um, hopefully you can see my window. Hey, Rupesh, I know you're having mic issues, but hopefully this is working. Uh, please let me know if it's not. Um, so again, yeah, so today's talk, you're audible. You're audible. Uh, okay, audible. Great. And, and you can see the slides as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Rupesh. Excellent. So, so our talk today is about game engines as 3D operating systems. Um, you know, I, I'm going to break up the talk kind of mostly into two parts. One, I'm going to talk about all the different sort of areas in which game engines have sort of permeated, you know. Um, and then that'll lay the foundation of, you know, how it really should, you know, in a way you can start thinking about game engines like 3D operating systems in, in today's, in, you know, in the way that they, they are designed today. So, so game engine applications have grown like well beyond game development. And, you know, some of the areas, of course, you know, they're used in games, but, you know, in terms of media and entertainment, you know, virtual production is another very big area of traction. Animation, so increasingly, uh, you know, more animation production is taking advantage of real-time workflows. This is actually my main area of expertise over, you know, over most of my career was at Pixar and working on animation films. Um, so it's very exciting to see, like, you know, we would always, when we worked on films, like not having a process that was truly interactive, you know, hurt, hurt creatively and, and, you know, hurt collaboration. So now having uh, a workflow that actually lets you work in real time is, is a, a huge advantage. Uh, I, I advise a studio called Spire Animation Studios, which is building its pipeline entirely with real time workflows. Um, events, of course, you know, the, the Travis Scott concert is famous with millions of people attending. So this idea of having, you know, and I know with COVID, of course, this has accelerated, but, you know, this is another area where, uh, you know, there's really a lot of growth and a lot of excitement. But there's also uh, interactive uh, applications of game engines, so building interactive interfaces in different ways. You know, I spent a couple of years leading a creative technology team at one of the banks in the U.S. called Capital One. And uh, this was an application we created with the Unity game engine. I'll show the video in just a second. Uh, it was called the Change Application. And we were radically trying to change the interface for how you look at your financial accounts. So if you have a bank account, we wanted to actually have a, a 3D representation of that bank account, um, you know, in terms of a Zen garden. Um, but all of the data being used to create this garden was all accurate data. So we were actually calling uh, our bank's APIs, our bank's, you know, the back end of our, our banking server and pulling all the customer data in real time and then showing it in this sort of 3D representation. And this experience uh, could be done either on a mobile phone or it could also be done uh, with virtual reality. So we had both, you know, with VR headsets as well as a way to, to experience this. So let me just share this is a short minute, a slightly over a minute long video. Welcome to Change. Let's begin. Welcome to the Change Garden. The garden represents your money and the things that you care most about. By taking action, your garden thrives. The core of the garden is the birdhouse. Here we have Robin, and he's delivering our latest mission. The garden is fueled by the user's work, and as they save their dollars from those early missions, they begin to learn more about deferred gratification and how they can use those dollars they save 
to fuel their goals and, and the things that they care most about. We intend to break these missions up into chapters. The first focusing on deferred gratification. Future chapters will deal with other topics such as savings, credit reduction, and investment, to name a few. Here we've used Unity. It's the game engine behind the garden. We could use any representation to drive the game. But to start, we've chosen the garden. This is... Um. So this, uh, so that application was very interesting. You know, we did some design research, and you know, the, about a, a third, you know, about a third of the users loved the interaction and loved how it worked. But about two thirds of the people who were more analytic really did not like it. But this was a very sort of, uh, you know, a blue sky experiment. So it's pretty interesting. This was another uh, application. This one is an augmented reality application, as you can see, where. We had a, a very, you know, a, a kind of experimental credit card that was made with different materials. And again, you know, being able to render in a 3D engine, you know, allows you to really bring out the materiality of the different card options. So let me just play this video. It's, again, very short little video. Hi there. Um, so here we have Card Studio, which we had originally built for a tablet uh, using Unity. And we are now, you know, we just kind of took a day or two and ported it over to the HoloLens. And just to show you really quickly how you can actually kind of interact with it. So if you see like my gaze or where I'm looking at kind of is indicated by that cursor, which I can use to select different things. So if I go like to the blue color, I can just tap on it. And now you can see that my card becomes blue. Um, I can go to midnight and kind of like the card will more. One of the cool things about using the HoloLens is you can totally move around. Like I can actually go up to this card and kind of check it out from the back. And look, it's still there. And um, so, um, yeah, so like, let's uh, let's go and like pick a different material, like so if you pick copper. So one of the other interesting things is because this is a 3D model, it will actually kind of reshade itself as we sort of move around, the specularity will update. And so that way, you, you know, especially for element, that's kind of really cool because so now we have a grazing angle because it's really about the material. So this like kind of lets you actually capture capture those material properties really well. So let's uh, go back here and switch to one of the resin cards. Um, uh, that one. Um, and so here now what you can also do. So we'll, we'll sort of move on. Uh, but, you know, these were very interesting projects for us uh, because, you know, we we had kind of our, the whole charter for our team, you know, uh, was use different emerging technologies, you know, VR, AR, game engines, and really create very unique and new types of interfaces. So it was it was sort of like we were paid to basically have fun in, in a sense. And, um, and, you know, and along the way, we would do a lot of customer research and we would learn, like, how customers were responding to these different projects. And the fact is that, you know, in, you know, we are moving increasingly into a world where people are very comfortable with 3D interfaces, you know, whether it's in, in Google Maps or, or you know, uh, using uh, like IKEA apps. So people are increasingly becoming more and more comfortable with, with these kind of interfaces. Um, interesting. And both of them uh, were built with Unity, actually, right? So... This actually was something that, you know, the Epic folks just recently posted and, and uh, definitely caught my attention because this is what I'm calling these kind of uh, embedded interfaces because also increasingly we have 3D devices that we are interacting with. So in this case, it's a Hummer. And uh, it's really interesting how they're using actually. So the, the, the head-mounted display in the Hummer is actually being rendered with the Unreal Engine. And what's particularly interesting is that they are taking advantage of the fact that they have a 3D rendering engine to actually show, like, for example, when the truck goes off road, you can actually see the suspensions and how they are changing in a perspective view, like as it adjusts to the ground. Now, you could, you know, in the absence of a 3D renderer, like you would have probably done that in some kind of a 2D view, which would have, uh, you know, necessarily simplified and maybe a, like, information would have been lost. But being able to actually show something that's a 3D object, you know, reacting in real time in a 3D interface is incredibly powerful. And I, I expect we will see more and more uh, embedded, you know, 3D embedded interfaces like this in the coming years.
Um, you know, architecture, engineering, construction is an area that, you know, we work in my startup, Duality Robotics. So this is, of course, an area that is very near and dear to me. But, you know, art, architecture visualization, product rendering, you know, simulation, digital twins, these are all areas that take advantage of game engines and not just superficially, right? They actually take advantage of the rendering. They take advantage of the physics. They take advantage of the interactivity. All of the things that you need to pull together a game experience. You know, these, these applications touch on every single one of those facets. And we'll do a deep dive with, you know, some of Duality's work uh, in, the, in the second half. Uh, but you'll see that the, the connections are actually very, very deep and, and similar to how games, you know, uh, complex 3D games are created. And then finally, there is the concept of the metaverse, right? So uh, I'm going to be teaching, you know, I teach, uh, I'm an adjunct professor at California College of the Arts in, in San Francisco. And uh, again, I teach emerging technology to design students there. And I'm really excited that this spring I'll be teaching a class on designing the metaverse, uh, you know, in partnership with Epic. And, you know, if you really look at all of these different things we've been talking about, you know, the, the blurring of, of the physical and the augmented world, you know, with things like VR and AR, you look at space design, you look at social, you know, the social aspects of gaming and, you know, expanding that to even more casual social networks. Entertainment, you know, we talked about events that are happening more and more online and are more sort of 3D in nature. I mean, people will be making their living in these, you know, online metaverses, people will be basically, uh, you know, it will be pushing the the envelope in terms of what technology and, and you know, uh, networking is capable of. So this, you know, if we, I suspect that we will look back at COVID and, and this very strange year that we've had as being kind of uh, the moment when, when metaverses really took birth. And, you know, their impact on society will be no less than, you know, the, the revolution that the Internet brought around at the, at the turn of the century. So this is going to be a very, very significant trend as well in the years to come. Um, so, I'm, you know, that sort of presents an overview of how, how game engines have really sort of evolved from being, you know, very specific to a game to being general across games to now actually being almost like 3D operating systems for a whole class of a whole host of applications that people are building, you know, that, that are 3D in nature. Um, and in this deep dive, I want to sort of um, unpack that a little bit because, you know, it's superficially that statement, you know, it, it, it's sort of self-evident. But uh, having in over the last 18 months really build, uh, having built an application at Duality that uses the Unreal Engine, in a very sort of differentiated way has taught us a lot of interesting lessons and I'm, uh, you know, I'm excited to share those with you today. So first, a little bit about Falcon, you know, which is our application. You know, it's basically, it's not a game, but it's an engineering tool that models robotics and automation workflows. And, and the primary reason that customers use Falcon is to generate synthetic data, essentially. And I'll cover some use cases at the end, you know, for different customer use cases. Um, but we use Unreal as a 3D operating system, you know, developing, you know, it gives us a very, very strong foundation. And, you know, uh, I should also mention that this work was actually partially funded by a mega grant from Epic. So this is something that they are very interested in as well. And I, I have to say that, you know, we've been in development now for about, you know, uh, a little over 15 months, then there's no way that we could have gotten as far as we have without actually having the shoulders of a game engine to stand on. Uh, but there are important gaps. If you want to use an, you know, an, uh, an off-the-shelf engine like Unreal or Unity, uh, it's important to understand also where the gaps are. Um, and, not, and I would say again, and not just for the kind of applications that, that you know, we are building, but even if you're building more complex games or games that take more advantage of user-generated content, if you want to open up your game and treat it more like an ecosystem, all of the things that I'm talking about are still uh, very important. So first, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, data models. So... Um, Again, you know, if you if you just ask yourself honestly, like when you build a game, do you think about what your data model is? 
Typically, you don't. You know, you have assets, you pull them in. You might think about interchange formats, but you almost never think about what is the actual underlying data model of your of your application, right? But if you think about building a website or you build, a, you know, making a backend for for a web server, you know, that's one of the first questions you ask yourself: is like, what is my data model? And the reason why it's important to have a data model is that that's what makes things very scalable. It makes things very robust, right? Um, in our case, we decided to use uh, Pixar's universal scene description as our data model. And again, in case some of you are not familiar with it, let me just explain that what USD is, is basically a way to allow for interchange between 3D, you know, different 3D applications. And it can allow you to build very, very complex worlds. You know, it can compose very complex worlds. So anytime you see a Pixar movie or if you see a Disney movie or, or, uh, or any of the Star Wars, actually what you're looking at is uh, complex, very large scale USD environments, essentially. Um, and the reason why USD is good, so actually Apple, for example, has in fact uh, adopted USD as its uh, 3D data model across the operating system itself. Um, but there are many reasons that it works well, right? Also, Omniverse from NVIDIA has adopted, you know, USD as its uh, data model. So it's something to definitely keep an eye on if you are interested in, you know, 3D assets and interchange of 3D assets and opening up your applications to being able to bring in different kinds of 3D assets. USD should certainly be something on your radar. I mean, there are certainly other data models too. GLTF is one. You know, there are, there are different data models, SDF. But we find USD to to work really well for at least what what we are doing in terms of this kind of high fidelity, you know, photo real worlds. And as I mentioned, it's already got fairly wide adoption, you know, across you know uh, a bunch of different studios that are already building it right into their applications um, from from ground up. And in our case, the data model, this US data model also maps really well to conceptually how our application works. So I mentioned that Falcon, you know, has uh, essentially got these worlds in which, you know, we have machines, autonomous machines, it could be drones, it could be self-driving cars, self-driving trucks that operate, you know, or, or even like a, 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 an autonomous bulldozer or a dump truck, right? They operate in different environments, could be a construction site, could be a forest, could be a city, right? So what happens in our simul simulation scenarios is we bring, you know, in, in this world, we bring one or more of these digital twin machines, which we call characters, and then they perform some kind of a mission, right? So they, they might fly, you know, you might say, hey, I want to fly this drone from here to there, or I want to, you know, do an inspection of, of some infrastructure, right? And what happens as the simulation is running, and the simulation is running in real time inside Unreal, is we are producing data. So we are producing data from sensors. We are producing, uh, you know, potentially even uh, data from the game state, right? Like what's happening inside inside the world of the game. So all of this data can be written out, and we actually ensure that the data has efficacy from an engineering standpoint. So this data is actually usable by robotics engineers or by machine learning engineers. So this is a very simple example of a, of a nanobot, you know, which is a simple, like a little, um, you know, it's built with an NVIDIA nanobot card. We actually use this robot as our sort of uh, a mascot to verify that our simulator was in fact performing the right physics and was behaving as a real machine would behave. So we actually built the same environment in a physical, you know, as a physical environment as well. And we had the nanobot, an actual nanobot robot as well, operating in that environment. And this, from a physics standpoint, this is called a two wheel base. So it's a skid steer system, which is like a, if you know the Segway or something, right? That's a very popular sort of uh, two wheel base as well. So let me just play this really quickly. Uh, let's take a look at how that maps to an actual project. So here we have a you know, uh, project, um, Falcon project, and you'll see that the folders map almost directly. So we have a scenario here, we have characters, we have assets, we have world. If I go into any of them, I have different worlds here that I can pick up or, or you know, potentially different characters that I can pick up. Um, when I load a scenario, so let's take a look at a scenario in a little bit more detail here. So all our scenarios start with like a simulation scope, basically. And then they are, uh, always have a scope called world under them. In this case, the world brings in different USD payloads, you know, for a, for a 
Duplo break and environment and so on. Uh, you can have brims as well. And then, you know, our character here is a nanobar, uh, and, you know, which is essentially defined as a tubular base. Um, let's take a look at the scenario in uh, USD view, which is, you know, obviously a static, uh, static view, but I can see the same hierarchy mapped out here. So I've got simulation world and, and you know, I've got my nanobot here. So I, I have the exact same hierarchy. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our nanobot a little bit more in detail because it's a little bit different. So, you know, it's a USD hierarchy as well. However, in this case, we also have certain machine uh, attributes, like let's say the motor, motor dorms, um, or we may have physical properties like the mass of the nanobot and central mass, or, you know, in the case of the wheels, we have, you know, linear and angular damping values. Um, I can also have other things in the hierarchy, such as you know, my front camera, and with, with different properties, such as lens distortion. And again, if we go back to our USB view and we open up Nanobot, you see the same properties. If I look at my front camera here, I can see that it's essentially got you know, lens distortion properties that I can set or view here as well. Now, let's, uh, let's start by uh, launching um, you know, Falcon and, and running the scenario. Uh, first. So once uh, Falcon comes up, I'm going to start a standalone scenario. You know, I'm going to pick uh, the scenario we were just talking about. And, uh, you know, in this case, it picked a rule for me because there's only one character, you know, and I can start the scenario here. And essentially that same uh, hierarchy comes up. You know, I've got the same objects here. But now I have a machine that is actually you know, uh, physically uh, accurate. It collides with things. Uh, it's got skid steer, so I can rotate uh, in place and so on. Great. So, fine, I, I have that. So what if I now swap out? So let's open up a scenario here. Um, and, um, you know, basically, if I simply take the same nanobot, but let's change the world now. So we are changing the world for an unreal level. You know, still brought in using USD, you know, but I'm now pointing to an actual asset, a, a USD, uh, sorry, an unreal asset here. And if I load that, then I will get something like this. So I have the same machine with the same physics, uh, etc. But now I'm inside, of course, a very different level here. Um, and what if I then go ahead and change? So let's say I use the same level, but let's uh, use a different machine uh, instead. So let's bring up, for example, a card copter here. So I have a different, now I, all I've done is I've changed out what the character is. Another thing worth calling out here is, you know, I've also got a landing pad, which comes from an entirely different pack file. So it's been packaged from an entirely different project you know, as, a, as a sort of a prop um, that I can bring into my level. I can still position it using USD. So I'm still placing it here to this definition. Uh, let's go ahead and load that. And now I have a, I have a card copter here. And, and you can see, you know, below I have my uh, landing pad as well here. Um, and, you know, I can obviously... So um, that kind of gives you an idea of, uh, you know, the flexibility that a data model like this brings. Um, actually, I, so, I should also mention that, you know, uh, I'm going to make sure that we have at least 15 minutes or, you know, hopefully maybe even more at the end for questions. Uh, unfortunately, as I'm presenting, I cannot see you or I cannot see any discussions uh, or questions that you might be, be posting. But Please hang in there. I mean, I'll, I'll answer questions at, at the end, uh, any questions that you might have. Um, but hopefully, you know, in seeing, uh, you know, the way that the USDs are laid out on an actual project might give you an idea of, you know, um, how it is structured and how, you know, it can add a lot of flexibility to the kind of uh, environments you present, uh, you know, whether it's a game or, or an application like this, you know, at runtime. And... I, you know, in this examples, I just changed like the machine itself or the world. But 
You could even take a machine. I can take this nanobot and, for example, move the wheels out or change the geometry of the wheels. I can change pretty much anything in this in this world that, that I want through through my USD or that's exposed in my USD. Uh, let's take a look at how. So uh, the second the second piece um, that I want to talk about, and and again, you know, if you're thinking about user generated comp, you know, content in games, and you know, the ability to really change the experience at runtime. So you know, the, so that your know, your you know your uh, players uh, or your users can get you know very differentiated experiences based on maybe how they've come to a level, or you know uh, what their objectives on a level might be. Um, having runtime flexibility is is very very useful. So what you see here is a forest environment we built for one of our customers, you know, Fortune 100 company, and we started uh, with actual like you know satellite imagery you see on the left here of an actual uh, place in the U.S., you know, in the Ozarks, and uh, we, that's where we got, you know, we use GIS data to create the terrain, we use satellite imagery to distribute vegetation, so this environment is actually uh, very accurate to that actual physical location, and in fact, you know, most of the features within the environment are accurate within half a meter or so. Um, so, the way we use Unreal to really build that kind of flexibility, and this is a little bit specific to Unreal. I'm hoping that there is a similar mapping in other game engines as well. But we use blueprints as a way to take assets and essentially build an, you know, build an interface around assets or a collection of assets you know, using a blueprint. And then we take all the properties in the blueprint, and those are automatically exposed in the USD model of that particular asset. So that allows you to change almost anything that has been authored, you know, within the blueprint can be changed then through the USD at runtime. And we do take the blueprints and all the underlying assets that the blueprints are built with, and we export them as pack files or package files, you know, out of Unreal. And so, you know, by combining this sort of property aspect of USD along with the pack file functionality of Unreal, you know, without a lot of extra effort and in a very sort of robust and generalized way, we are able to expose uh, almost every aspect of, uh, of an environment or a machine uh, to be flexible at runtime. And I'll take an example uh, to show you. So, so the, you know, the way this works for machines is actually kind of very specific. We have a process called bot injection. So if you see on the top right here, you see uh, a blueprint that has a template of a two wheel base. You know, if you see those, uh, you know, checkerboard wheels and, and, and there's a chassis that's a box. It's a very, you know, it's a very generic version of a two wheel base, which has actually physics and constraints already defined on it. But then at runtime, you can replace all of those geometries with the nanobot that we just saw before and that you see below here. Additionally, I can add sensors in the USD hierarchy. I can add attachments. So I can definitely uh, modify this machine in a lot of different ways. You know? And all of this happens at runtime. Right? None of this is built into a binary. This is all functionality that is exposed to our users at runtime. Um, I'll give you another example of uh, runtime flexibility where we show how a environment like this, which has got scatter in it, you know, we're scattering different foliage, and uh, and you know, and you have this sort of uh, utility poles. You have this infrastructure that is also in this environment, and and we'll look at how all of that can be defined at runtime using this combination of pack files, you know, uh, wrapped in you know, sort of assets wrapped in blueprints, then exported as pack files that are then modified via USD. So we'll look at an example that kind of does So that. Let's, uh, let's just dive into that. Um, so you can see that, you know, this environment has sort of a lighting payload, you know, typical um, USD payload there. Um, then we are bringing in essentially a terrain, a terrain level from Unreal. So we are taking advantage of all of the terrain tools that exist. Uh, one thing to call out here is you also have the ability to set attributes uh, for example, if you have a level blueprint and you can control, in this case, for example, the amount of fog in the environment directly from the USD. Um, where things get really interesting is once we, we look at sort of foliage scanner. So if you look at the way foliage scanner is done, here uh, we have a blueprint, essentially, that's actually handling the scattering. 
And this has been packaged up, of course. Right? And along with it, uh, in the same pack file, there are also lots of different static meshes. And by using this list here, the blueprint, you can specify exactly which static meshes should be scattered. There's a density map, right? So you can control exactly where they will be scattered. And certainly, you know, you've got other parameters, for example, the density threshold that will control essentially how, you know, how many uh, foliage um, pieces will be scattered. And that gives you a lot of control. So you can, you can set up different variations. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're debugging or, you know, you just focus more on speed, you can reduce the density or reduce the amount of foliage and get a much quicker, uh, you know, start time. Uh, power line is also similarly scattered using the blueprint. But in this case, it's a little bit different form of scatter. You know, we are specifying a static mesh again for what is to be scattered. And then there is an array of, uh, of latitude and longitude values, basically GPS values of where the scatter should, should happen. So a lot of control there, leveraging, you know, the visual programming ability of blueprints and then using USD attributes along with that to make sure that, you know, we have that sort of runtime flexibility, that tunability that our customers need. So we're going to load up this environment now. And, you know, we've got a quadcopter in here. You know, we've got different kinds of vegetation um, that's available. And all of this was created at runtime, so to be very clear, right? So nothing existed before. All of it is tunable as an environment. Um, another piece I wanted to actually highlight is also, uh, let's turn on our LiDAR here. So we'll, we'll go ahead and turn on our LiDAR. And um, now, you know, we have a sensor that is scanning our entire environment, 60 hertz. You know, it's very, very performant. We use compute shaders. So when, you know, when we run these electro-optical sensors or LiDAR, this is an image-based one. We also have an adjacent one. But we use compute shaders to transfer that data directly to our API. So that it can be very, very performant um, as well. Um, and, and we're going to go talk about exactly how this sensor is being controlled um, just in a second. Great. Um, oh, and, I, you know, uh, for that work, I should also give a shout out to uh, Green Rain Studios, you know, who we also uh, partner with here in Mumbai. And, and they did a lot of the ASP work there, even some of the programming works. So great, great team there. And, and, you know, we work with, you know, we work with them on some of that. Um, so the next piece I want to talk about is, you know, uh, programmatic control. And now this may or may not matter, you know, depending on your application. But let's imagine you want to build a really sophisticated machine. You know, let's say you want to build a really sophisticated AI agent in your game or, or you know, AI behavior where you might even want to run, you know, entire machine learning models outside to do perception or to do other activity, right? Most game engines have some amount of agent behavior built in, but it's pretty rudimentary. So imagine being having access to all the machine learning tools that you know a self-driving car might use or, or, or an autonomous drone might use, right? And so the way we do that is by using a Python API. And Python is sort of the lingua franca for robotics and data science and machine learning and a lot of other things. So it's a great way. Like imagine, for example, that in your game, you wanted to be able to fetch live weather data to change how your world, you know, the world's weather uh, inside the game. Or if you wanted to actually look at, um, you know, I, I'm always looking on my app at the, uh, you know, the air quality index, uh, you know, every morning. And if you wanted to change, you know, uh, how much haze you have in, in, in your level. I mean, all of this is possible. You know, the connections between what is going on in the virtual world of your game and what's actually happening in the physical world, these things can be really, really tied together. And there are ways to use APIs from outside. And Python is a really great way to actually access all these different functions and APIs that you might want. Want to get data out of that are external. You could run entire machine learning models that are potentially external. Um, so I'm going to share in this video actually how the API works. I showed a little bit at the end of the last video how, you know, when I turn on the LiDAR, you know, it started scanning the environment. You know, so LiDAR is sort of a, a laser-based scanner. And, uh, you know, this we, we'll look at the script of how that LiDAR was actually being controlled here. 
So if you look at our USD definition of the quadcopter, our character here, you'll see that there's a Python module and a Python class that's actually associated with this machine. And if we look at that Python script, you'll see that basically, you know, we start out, uh, we set up, you know, different aspects of how we want to display our LiDAR or, or execute our LiDAR. And then you've got callbacks, you know, this is begin play. So you've got basically callbacks here that will exactly match what you would have in the engine. So in the begin play, I can do a sensor setup. I have end play. In the tick, um, you know, I'm basically calling um, uh, the LiDAR, uh, you know, I'm calling the LiDAR's render function, basically. And then I can see the output from from that LiDAR. And this is how we control all our machines. So even when I'm flying the quadcopter, there is no logic actually inside Unreal that is causing that quadcopter to fly. All of the actuations come, you know, through, a, through basically a teleoperation script. And from the standpoint of a platform, you know, characters that are controlled programmatically in this way versus ones controlled by humans uh, are exactly the same. Right. So, so imagine, you know, that if you have a, a, you know, autonomous truck, the software that actually drives the autonomous truck on the road can be the exact same software that actually drives uh, the digital twin of that truck in our, you know, in our simulator. And the sensors on our simulated truck can actually feed that autonomous stack and then the actual actuation of the machine, you know, the, the way that the braking and the steering and the acceleration work, the exact, you know, uh, commands that would be sent to the physical truck can be sent to our virtual truck. And so, you know, by having this Python API, we can really connect to uh, things that are outside the game engine as well and, and sort of have a, you know, a data relationship in both directions. Um, this is sort of an overview of the architecture of Falcon, right? So, and, and you know, kind of going back to this idea of, uh, of Unreal Engine as a 3D operating system, right? A normal operating system has functions like file systems and memory management, process management, networking, security, so on. Unreal Engine for us provides, as a 3D operating system, it provides the 3D hierarchy. It provides, you know, very uh, high level, you know, high fidelity and high quality 3D rendering. It provides physics. It provides concurrent interactivity. We'll look at that in a second, you know, when you start, start talking about multiplayer. And then it actually provides a level editor. It even provides all these other tools. Like if you think about an operating system, you've got a debugger and you've got a compiler. I mean, there's a set of tools that comes with an operating system. And in the same way, you know, a, a 3D operating system like Unreal provides you with a set of tools like level editors and pack, you know, uh, pack file tools that allow you to fully take advantage of, of that, you know, of that 3D operating system itself. And then Falcon, of course, has been built, you know, out of these different plugins. So our entire architecture is built from plugins. So if you look at our main application, it's actually empty. There's an empty level and there is no classes in it because all it does is it pulls in all the different uh, plugins that, you know, in a very modular way, define our, our entire architecture. Again, if you're building complex games, I would highly encourage you to really think about how you're architecting, you know, your, your application as well, because uh, complexity grows exponentially. And, and you know, it's, it's sort of a combinatorial problem. So if you're not careful up front, you know, you, before long, you'll have a application in which even, you know, architecture in which even you will not be able to find your way around, right? Leave aside a new person that might be coming onto your team. And then, as I mentioned, we use this Python API as our sort of gateway to, uh, you know, everything from machine learning, you know, frameworks like TensorFlow, uh, or, you know, ro you know, there's something called robot operating system that, you know, integrates to robotics workflows, you know, sensor data, actuation data, even the USD parsing actually comes through our Python API. Um, then uh, one more point to make as you know, you're thinking about these kind of applications is really you have to also think about multiplayer from the very beginning because, um, uh, you know, if you think about, uh, so uh, if you think about essentially how replication works in, in an engine like Unreal, it's, it's sort of uh, the, the behavior is very specific, right? And, and if it works for you, it works for you. But if it doesn't work for you, like in our case, we are we are actually instantiating the entire world and, and all of the characters at runtime. So replication actually does not work very well for us. Actually, it, it's even worse, right? We don't even have a clear way for associating a, a actor 
on the server with ones on different clients because there is no naming uh, there is no naming conventions that actually keep them the same uh, you know in the engine it's, it's all happens that you know it's it's all dependent on what the engine does and so we actually again here we leverage the usd hierarchy and the usd scopes because those don't change and we tag all our actors by their usd scopes it actually allows us to make sure that the server and all the clients are synchronized in terms of all the assets so we had to think about all of these things right up front because you know if we had built it as a standalone application and then tried to force a, a multiplayer behavior into it, it you know we would have almost had to rethink the entire architecture so i'll, I'll just uh, yeah the last example or you know i have is uh, is just so a multiplayer uh, multiplayer example to start our server here and that has two characters is a backhoe and a quadcopter in a desert environment and i'm going to start up my client and join as the quadcopter in which is my role here yeah, to, can you start your client as the back yeah. Yeah. sorry rupesh is something uh, something wrong very cool so you are uh, going to start off at Oh, let me Please. pause for a second. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just saying, fifteen minutes left. Got you it. Take Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and this is an environment which has like some you know, wind turbines here, and you can see uh, it's a it's sort of a dynamic environment. You know, pretty decent scale. And then there's a solar farm there. So you know, I I'm going to head it that way because oh, there is Roberto as the backhoe, and he's zipping along. Uh, so let me see if I can uh, get in this. I'm guessing, Roberto, you can't see me yet. Or I'm probably pretty high for you, but let me see if I can catch up with you. Okay. How about how about now? Are you are you able to make? Yeah, I can see your shadow. Excellent. Uh, oh, you can see my shadow, but not me. Yet. Okay, I'm gonna try to catch up. You Italians and you're like race cars. What are you doing? You're like driving a backhoe, but you're not staying still. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so basically, we've got two different machines, you know, sharing the same environment. They're running their own physics. You know, we had talked about the Python API before. So right now, both of them are also running their own Python scripts that are actuating the machines. And if, uh, if you had sensors that were active, you could also be recording from those. So everything is working actually same as in the standalone version. But here we can have multiple machines that are basically sharing the same context and can collaborate or you know compete or participate in different ways. Uh, and we can mix any set of machines in any environment. So you could take any Unreal level, basically turn it into a, a, a sandbox, and you can bring in as many machines as you want, and they can all join uh, in a multiplayer session. So this very quickly, I'm going to zip through some actual customer case studies. So these are the kind of people, these are our users, people who actually use Falcon. Um, you know, one of them uses it to do energy infrastructure inspection. It's a Fortune 100 company. So they basically have drones that fly around energy infrastructure and look for um, defects. And so it's it's for, you know, the, the synthetic, we were generating synthetic data that actually trains their machine learning models. Um, you know, we worked with a self-driving truck company. Uh, unfortunately, that since has gone bankrupt. But, um, you know, we proved that our, our digital twin of the truck was accurate to within a few centimeters of the actual physical truck. So we took field data by riding in the truck with them and, and you know, uh, made sure that uh, the data produced, you know, by using the physics in our system is actually very, very accurate. Um, we worked with a sidewalk robot company that has since been acquired, but for them, we, it was more of a perception problem. So we were actually, we built this sort of city block, you know, a couple of city block environment for them that had all the kind of different features that they were interested in their, their robot being able to identify and then sort of navigate uh, uh, correctly around. Uh, and then one of our interns actually built this sort of uh, drone application where, you know, given a GPS location, a drone can fly there and then fly in a grid, you know, in a grid pattern, taking images from the sensor and then sending those images to Google Vision's API and, and figuring out actually how much of that area has forest fire in it. So these are just some actual practical applications of, you know, how our customers use, uh, use Falcon. 
So that kind of concludes my little bit of a deep dive. So popping the stack and then wrapping up here really quickly is, you know, we looked at, you know, specifically for, for dualities, Falcon Simulator, you know, how we are using Unreal as a game engine. But I think that these concepts are much broader and have a much broader application, right? So I think you're going to increasingly see game engines being used more and more as 3D operating systems in this way. And really thinking about the architecture of your application, whether it's a game or you know, a simulator like ours or you know, a metaverse, um, and really thinking about the data model, thinking about how you're going to connect to other workflows you know, and always think about multiplayer from the very beginning. I mean, these are some key lessons that at least we learned from, from our experience. Um, so let me uh, stop sharing and hopefully we can take some questions. All right. Uh, uh, so uh, Rupesh, how should we do this? So there will be one question. Uh, I think there's one question on the Q and A panel. Can you look at? Okay. So, so USB actually has uh, has a concept of LOD as well. So, uh, we you know LOD is a first class concept. Both you know level of detail as well as instancing are both first class concepts uh, in uh, in USD, just like they are in Unreal as well. And uh, we haven't built out that part of our, our USD, um, you know, support yet, but it's, it's very much on our roadmap because I think it's very important, obviously, um, to be able to support both, both, you know, LOD and instancing in that way. Um, it's a good, good question. How to build simulations like you sh you've shown? What are the prerequisites we should be good at? Um, Right. So simulations uh, are an area that you could spend your entire entire life doing. You know, one of the first simulators or one of the first simulations I did in animation was, uh, you know, when Dory gets hit uh, and, you know, her nose starts bleeding and, you, you, you know, we simulated the blood as it goes up in water, right? So you've got blood inside water. Uh, or actually even before that on ants, you know, we did fluid simulations, you know, for, uh, for water. Um, so simulations, you could spend your whole life doing simulations. And I would say if you are really interested in simulators, right, I would look first, I would look at rigid body simulators. It's probably the easiest place to start, um, you know, or particle simulators like Niagara, because you learn, you know, it's all the same physical principles, right? So uh, whether, you know, you use Unity's particle simulator or use Niagara, you know, uh, that's a good place to start um, setting up um actual simulations and what i would do is like i would suggest like take a look at uh, take a look at tutorials to learn a little bit about the simulation system but what i found the most useful for myself is then to actually give myself a specific task right like okay i want to simulate you know uh, let's say a, a, you know a, a tornado right and so i give myself a specific uh, objective right and then i have to go reverse engineer what the physics for that should be and how can I how can I make a tornado basically right uh, I, I hope that's helpful so I would say particle systems are always a good place to start rigid body simulations are also very accessible when you get into things like fluid simulation uh, hair simulation clock simulation then things are a little bit more complicated um, but but I think you know if you start with those foundational simulators and our you know rigid body and particles like it should give you a way to sort of keep uh, kind of advancing your knowledge. Um, how to start these careers without masters in these fields? Actually, it doesn't, you know, uh, Mayur, it doesn't matter, honestly, right? Because a lot of, again, as I said, you know, if you think about, um, uh, if you think about Unreal as a 3D operating system, right? Like a lot of the sort of hard work, so actually it's not, the physics is not even coming from Unreal Engine, it's actually coming from uh, physics, actually, which is an NVIDIA simulator. And that, you know, they're gradually, you know, Epic is replacing with Chaos, which is a physics simulator they are building. But, you know, a lot of this heavy lifting is done for you. And again, because, you know, when we used to do simulations before in animation, 
or in visual effects, you know, we had tools that you had to wait two hours and three hours to actually see the results of simulation. So you would change something, wait two hours, see if it actually did what you wanted it to do. But with game engines, I mean, you can almost manipulate the controls in real time and your, you know, and your simulator will respond. So you have this great feedback loop to learn, right? So the best thing I would do is like start playing around with examples. Like I said, start with some tutorials and, and then change it. Don't just like follow the tutorial, but then experiment with it. Like, what if I change this parameter? What if I change gravity in this way? What if I change angular damping? How does that change things? Right? That's how you learn, in my opinion. Right? I think having a degree is not required. You don't have to have a PhD in physics to do these things anymore. Um, sorry, I, I think it scrolled off. Um, how do you, um, sorry. How do you see XR integrating into duality's uh, roadmap. So mixed reality is, um, is actually like, so this is one of the nice things about having game engines as a 3D operating system, right, is you can change the rendering uh, as current, as you well know, uh, you can obviously change uh, absolutely like how, uh, how the rendering happens or what is the actual device on which you're rendering. So I can, you know, I can say that, okay, if I want to look from a sensor's point of view, uh, you know, in, in, let's say, you know, with virtual, you know, with a virtual reality headset, I mean, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything special because I can just use that capability of the game engine to do that. So, I mean, that's one of the benefits. And really, again, if I had, you know, if I built an application where I was doing all this myself, I, every new device that comes along, like, you know, whether it's a HoloLens or the next VR headset or the next XR headset, I would have to figure out how to support it within my application. But, you know, when now when these new headsets come out, the, their first priority before they even release the hardware is integrating it with game engines because they know that's the only way people are going to be able to author content for their particular device. And so by being in that 3D, you know, in, by being in that game engine ecosystem, you are getting that integration essentially for free. You know. uh, and the impact XR game engines uh, and the impact of XR on game engines as 3D. So hopefully I've covered that, right? Like, I mean, um, I think that authoring for mixed reality, you know, whether it's VR, AR, you know, other, other hybrid forms of, of uh, you know, uh, blurring the line between physical virtual rendering. I mean, these things are so much easier to do now uh, because of game engine. And so I think that's partly why we are seeing this sort of real explosion in that kind of XR content. Um, is it possible to build a scale of project independently, including the Python API? You know, our team is not very big, Sajid. You know, we have on the platform team, so our, you know, our overall team is about 12 people, but that includes about half our team is solutions engineering that works very closely with our customers. So my co-founder actually is a robotics engineer. You know, he participated in the DARPA grand challenge and, you know, worked in field robotics at Caterpillar for like over a decade. So that, you know, he, there is a team that, you know, he works with that, you know, partner with our customers. And then the platform team, which I lead, you know, it's basically about six people, right? And then, as I mentioned, we we worked also with Green Rain, helped us out with, um, you know, with some of the asset work in the beginning and even also some of the, the, the development on the engine side. We are actually creating a subsidiary in Mumbai. In fact, that's one of the things I'm here in Mumbai for. So we will be creating a subsidiary from the beginning of, uh, of the year. So if you're interested in these kind of problems, you know, please... Uh, please, you know, do go to uh, duality.ai's website and, and, and email us uh, because we will be looking for uh, for game developers, 3D artists, you know, technical artists uh, for our for our India team as well. You know, so I think it's very possible to build these kind of applications, um, and and you know. Um, some things are a little tricky. We have uh, we have a magician on our team, uh, Roberto, who who really kind of wrote our Python API, and and some of those things can get a little bit trickier, but um, you know definitely possible. Um, the Python part was fascinating. Um, is there a link on how to get started with ML in Unreal? So unfortunately, Baram, uh, Unreal has not yet invested in a ML ecosystem in quite the same way that Unity has done. So Unity actually has a dedicated team 
that is working on machine learning problems. Um, I have a, you know, my hope is that, you know, uh, with partners like us, you know, Unreal will start to uh, have more of a presence in machine learning because I think when it comes to synthetic data generation, I think that there are certain advantages to, you know, again, I'm not going to go into the, the engine wars. It's not my purpose at all. But, you know, there are definitely some, you know, when it comes to rendering, there are certain benefits to the Unreal Engine and for us also having the multiplayer capability. So my hope is that, you know, very soon in the next three months, four months, I expect some important announcements from uh, from Epic on how they will be supporting machine learning uh, ecosystems more fully as they have done, you know, with virtual production and other ecosystems. Um, but today, if you want to do something today, then, you know, actually Unity is probably got more out of the box features for that. Uh, or, you know, you can work with a platform like ours. You've shown a project of forest fire drone done by intern. Can you give uh, more details? Um, so Bonagiri, um, uh, in, de in terms of details, I mean, uh, you know, what we are doing there is we've got a forest environment. We are using, you know, a fire effect that we actually got from the asset store. And we sort of set up a spread model around that just with particles. Right. So that was just giving a you know, way for the forest fire to organically uh, grow over time. Uh, I may be out of. OK, uh, how are we doing on time? We got a couple minutes. OK, so so basically. Um, so that's how, just just one more. OK, minute. so that's how we got the forest fire set up. And then the drone, as I mentioned before, is actually being controlled by a Python script. So the intern who was working with us, you know, he's actually not even from game development side. He's actually a software engineer working, again, more in machine learning problems. So he wrote the actual uh, Python script to actuate the drone, to fly the drone and, and you know, and navigate in the path that he wanted. And then uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Google Vision API, but it's a really, you know, pretty robust API where you can give it images, almost any images, and it'll tell you labels that are associated. It's the same, actually, machine learning model that drives Google search, the image search in Google as well. So it's quite, you know, it's quite extensive. And uh, again, in, a, in your game, if somebody held up a photograph of an object and said, hey, can you identify this, right? I mean, that's how I would do that. I wouldn't try to build a machine learning model within your game. I would try to go out to something like Google Visions API. And by the way, Python is certainly one way you can do it because it's very flexible for our customers. But you can actually call APIs in C++ as well, right? So you could actually write C++ classes that can also call call APIs. Um, does, the, does your T-shirt have solid angle? Yes, my T-shirt is an old SIGGRAPH solid angle T-shirt. And so it has the equation of radiance on it, which, uh, you know, yay, uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, your talk and your project pitch, awesome. Where can we find more, uh, more case studies? Um, so I, I, hopefully, uh, if you go to our website, there are some more case studies, more details uh, on, on a more detailed case studies. Um, and then, you know, we are also working with Epic on some case studies as well that hopefully maybe will, will uh, you know, come out in, uh, very soon. So. Well, thank you. It looks like I got through most of the questions right, right on the dot. So, again, yeah, thank perfect. you so very much for taking, you know, an hour out of your evening to, to hang out. And uh, I hope to, you know, hear from you guys, uh, you know, uh, and especially if you're interested in, in the kind of work that Duality is doing, like I said, we're setting up a team here. So would love to hear from you for that as well. Um, thank, thank you so much. And thank you, Rupesh and Srini. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. Hey, thanks, Apurva. Thanks, Apurva. It was a great talk. Thank All right. Bye-bye.